Welcome back, everyone. This will be my Thor Love and Thunder full breakdown of the entire movie Easter eggs for everything. There were a bunch of references and obviously things setting up the future Marvel Phase 4, especially the post credit scenes. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. We're doing a giveaway for IMAX tickets. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite Easter egg or reference from the movie in the comments. Careful for spoilers from the entire movie, we'll be talking about everything. Just starting at the beginning, we'll work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along. Thor is the first original Avengers character from Marvel Phase 1 to get a fourth solo movie in a spin-off franchise, even though next we're actually going to get a Captain America 4, but it's going to be Anthony Mackie's Falcon version of Captain America, so technically not the same character, but it is the fourth film in that spin-off franchise. The actual title of the movie, Love and Thunder, is a reference to Gore's daughter, who is named Love in the movie, in Thor himself, who at the end of the film agrees to take care of her raising her as his own child. Together they go on adventures around the universe saving people, and they're known as Love and Thunder, with both of them wielding Thor's weapons. She wields Stormbreaker now, and Thor wields Mjolnir again because Jane Foster has died and gone to Valhalla. The movie's mostly based on the plot from the Gore storyline in the comics and the Mighty Thor storyline, which was the arc where Jane Foster became a version of Thor, done in a very 80s style, like lots of 80s references throughout the film, just the entire vibe of the film, as well as the music. Like all the Guns N' Roses, the Dio, all that stuff was pure Taika. It was kind of meant to be in the same tone as Thor Ragnarok, like a super version of Ragnarok. The reason why Love is able to wield Stormbreaker without the power of the weapon just melting her brain is because she has the powers of a god. The way they explain this is because it's a side effect of her being recreated by Eternity, the cosmic entity. There are a couple big changes with the way they use the Eternity character and the other cosmic entities. I'll explain when we get to that part of the movie. But they basically just say that now she also has the bonus of having the powers of a god. Thor didn't give her any special powers after the fact. She's played by Chris Hemsworth's real-life daughter, India Hemsworth, which is why her accent sounds different from Christian Bale's accent. The basic intro of the movie, like the opening scene, how he gets the Necro Sword, is all meant to be right out of the comics. It's pretty close to a version of the comic book story. His family died, then he learned that the gods of his people didn't care to intervene, and he vows his revenge. In the comics, he just found two random aliens, one gold and one black, that had been locked in battle and died together, one of them holding the Necro Sword, and he just takes the Necro Sword from that black alien. Its power forms a suit around him, allowing him to leave the planet, and then he just goes on his quest to kill his own people's gods, and then he sets on his quest to kill the rest of the gods around the universe. That's kind of what happens during the movie, like he enters the space where his gods live, and the Necro Sword calls to him, showing you the dead body of the previous wielder. Now, one of the things they don't explain in the movie, though, is that there are voices coming from the Necro Sword that whisper to him, calling to him. They never fully explain who this is, but even though they explain the Necro Sword comes from the Shadow Realm in the comics, and they have all these shadow beasts that he summons with the Necro Sword from the same dimension, they could always wind up tying the powers of the Necro Sword, the Necro Sword itself, to the Null backstory like they did in the comics. But originally, when it debuted in the comics, it was just the plain old Necro Sword. It didn't have any of that Null Venom backstory yet. The whole idea with the power of the Necro Sword, it choosing Gore is meant to be a parallel for Jane Foster and Mjolnir calling to her, also killing her when she used it the same way that the Necro Sword was killing Gore and him using it. Like the more both of them use their special weapons, the faster they die. One of the big changes from the Gore storyline in the comics though is his ultimate plan. So ultimately he finds a quicker way to kill all the gods in the universe and that is the God Bomb. He just forces the God of Bombs to create a bomb that will kill all gods in the universe simultaneously. It's sort of like his Thanos level Infinity Gauntlet workaround to do everything in one fell swoop. In the movie, they basically use that for the Eternity plot. He's going to go to Eternity and make a wish and wish that there are no gods. But in the comics, Eternity doesn't work like that. It's not like a one-time only use kind of genie situation. Eternity generally doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day of lesser beings. Usually it delegates that to the Celestials and other more powerful cosmic entities and beings. The beings that you see in the temple at the end are all cosmic entities. They're generally meant to be so powerful that they very rarely ever get involved in stories. Don't worry, I'll talk about all them when we get to that part of the movie because there are some really cool Easter eggs and references there. There were a couple big deleted scenes early in the movie that Christian Bale revealed. He said that when Gore's daughter dies, he said there was a scene of him howling this primordial scream, like blood curling scream that Marvel just said, no way you're putting that in the movie. It's just way too freaky. And there was a scene of him mutilating his own body to remove all the religious tattoos. That's why later in the film, you see all those scars all over his head, all over his face and his body is because he mutilated himself to remove all those religious markings. Marvel also said too gruesome, not putting that in the movie. 
The movie itself was only about two hours long, so it was actually really short for a typical Marvel movie. Natalie Portman also revealed there's a ton of deleted scenes, so I'll point them out when we get to those parts of the movie when they were featured. Later, when they're looking at all the distress signals and you find out what happened to Sif and Falagar, the other really giant rat-looking god, there's a scene of gods being strung up and killed. That's meant to be Gore's people's gods in the comics. The new Marvel intro that they use in this movie is the same one that we've been watching in the Miss Marvel episodes. It has Moon Knight in it and it has some Doctor Strange 2 scenes. Usually every time there's like a brand new big Marvel movie, they update it just a little bit with new scenes from the previous film. They do play a custom metal version of the Marvel Studios fanfare music because there's this whole 80s metal music vibe through the entire movie. They don't actually name the planet of the blue aliens that they go to at the beginning of the film, but the king is named Yakan. Yondu's arrow is called the Yaka arrow, which now belongs to Kraglin along with his fin. So closest connection I could think to these blue aliens would be Yondu's people, the Centaurians. But I don't actually think that the Centaurians because their faces do look a little bit different. Taika Waititi explains that the present day of the film takes place about three years after Avengers Endgame, so it's about 2026 during the events of the movie, which would make it the latest in Marvel Phase 4 that we've been so far in the timeline, not including the Loki series, because that's like billions of years later at the very end of the timeline. They show a brief flashback montage to just explain what's been happening with Thor since Avengers Endgame with some Enya music. He's been hanging out with the Guardians of the Galaxy. They show him losing all the weight. They have a bunch of jokes. While he's going through the workout montage, you don't ever find out who the skeleton of the alien is. The proportions of the head to the body aren't quite right for it to be one of the Watchers. But based on how big the dwarves are, it could be a dwarven skeleton. The hat he's wearing says Strongest Avenger that he wrote in Sharpie himself. It's meant to be a big callback to Thor Ragnarok with the joke about him being stronger than the Hulk. The actual front of the hat though, the logo is meant to be in the classic Avengers comic book art font saying Earth's Mightiest Heroes. They show a couple flashback scenes of Thor as a child being carried into battle with a tiny sized hammer. It's not meant to be Mjolnir, it's just like a regular tiny hammer. The woman is also supposed to be just a random Asgardian warrior woman. It's not his mother Frigga or a member of the Valkyrie because by this point the Valkyrie had already been killed off except for Valkyrie herself. They have a short montage of Thor growing up through the different ages because he's about 1500 years old in present day. The youngest version of Thor here, little kid Thor, is actually played by Chris Hemsworth's real life son. Natalie Portman's children, Taika Waititi's children, and Christian Bale's children were all also in the movie. Natalie Portman and Taika Waititi's kids were in the group that were stolen by Gore, and then Christian Bale's kids, because they're a little bit older, I think that they were featured in all the scenes in New Asgard with all the tourism stuff. The teenage version of Thor is wearing a version of the classic Jack Kirby costume like the original Thor costume with the old school comics, the gold boots, the gold highlights. Later he brings that back for his Ravagers version of the uniform. This version of the suit is meant to be right before the first Thor movie. The joke about his wolf woman girlfriend I think is meant to foreshadow the Lycan children living in New Asgard, which itself is more foreshadowing for vampires and werewolves showing up in the Werewolf by Night Halloween special later this year and during the Blade movie with vampires next year. The large wolf that they're also doing it on might also be a reference to the same race as the wolves that Hela's cosmic wolf Fenris comes from, which is also itself from Norse mythology. When they're talking about Thor's relationship with Jane Foster, they show some Dark World footage. They have jokes with Kor getting her name wrong. First he calls her Jane Fonda, then later he calls her Jodie Foster. They have a couple of jokes about the other Warriors 3 that died during Ragnarok, saying this guy, this guy, this guy, like they can't be bothered to learn their names. He also jokes about Loki's three different supposed deaths. Just to clarify, this is original Loki that was killed by Thanos and he's meant to be perma-dead that time. So like Jane Foster goes to Valhalla at the end of the film in this alternate dimension, she could speak to a version of Loki. He would be there. He mentions Heimdall's death to foreshadow Heimdall's cameo in the post credit scene. They don't explain who these robots are in this one flashback scene where they're fighting on a different planet, but if you think you know who they are, write their name in the comments below. When he plants Stormbreaker in the ground near the tree, they reveal that because it's made from Groot's body, a lot of you have had this theory in the past, that it continues to grow over time. Like the axe is kind of alive because that part of the axe is alive at least. That's why when he rips it out of the ground, it's already grown roots. They have this running gag during the film where Stormbreaker kind of gets its own teenage Groot kind of storyline. Like they had that during the Avengers movies and the Guardians of the Galaxy movies where baby Groot grows up and becomes this really mouthy version of a teenager. Because technically Stormbreaker is meant to be a teenager, so to speak, during the film, at least the way that Taika Waititi explains it, it's supposed to be kind of similar during the film because they have this weird love quadra angle between Thor, Stormbreaker, Natalie Portman's Jane Foster, and Mjolnir. Like Thor has had relationships with all these different people. The way he treats the hammer and the axe is that they're both alive. 
But even though they've been kind of ambiguous about this in the movies, in the comics, the hammer is actually alive. It actually possesses the soul of this cosmic sentient storm that's trapped inside it. So like the hammer itself eventually does wind up speaking literally to Jane Foster during her arc when she becomes Mighty Thor. They have a joke about Thor looking kind of like a witch riding on Stormbreaker like you would ride on a broom as he flies to help the Guardians of the Galaxy into the blue aliens. They don't actually name the bird aliens that they're fighting, but the way they look, they look kind of like Muppets from the Labyrinth movie. In the movie, all the Guardians of the Galaxy all get new costume upgrades. Groot is only a tiny bit bigger, but he's still a teenage Groot, pretty much the same personality. Star-Lord's costume is Yondu's jacket, basically, like he's been wearing Yondu's jacket, but he's upgraded with a lot of the costume designs from Ego the Living Planet. So he has a bunch of metal pieces on it, all the designs look kind of like celestial designs, like he's accepted his origin story that Ego was his father. They reveal Thor's Ravager costume is just a combination of a bunch of Asgardian-themed Easter eggs. It's meant to be a version of Eric Masterson's Thunderstrike 80s costume from the comics, which is why he looks kind of like construction worker Thor. He's got the gold boots from the classic Thor costume. He's got the World Tree looking tank top t-shirt, which is also meant to be an Easter egg for Kurt Russell's t-shirt during Big Trouble Little China, who also did play Ego the Living Planet during Guardians of the Galaxy 2. He also has an Asgardian belt buckle, but I don't think it's meant to be his special belt that doubles his strength. In the jacket is basically just like a Ravager's jacket that he's cut up and repurposed. The aliens also have this joke where they call him the god of destruction, even though he's the god of thunder, because he destroys their sacred temple in trying to save it. But when he goes on the attack, they start playing Guns N' Roses' Welcome to the Jungle from the Appetite for Destruction album. There's a couple songs in the movie from that album and some separate Guns N' Roses songs. They also play Sweet Child of Mine, Paradise City, and November Rain. November Rain is the one from a different album. Axl Rose probably got a sweet check from this movie. And speaking of Axl Rose, Heimdall's son, Astrid, is now calling himself Axl, inspired by Axl Rose from actual Guns N' Roses. When he does the splits between the vehicles, that's also meant to be a Van Damme joke, but it's also a reference to the commercial that Van Damme did, where he did the splits between a couple 18-wheelers, which itself was meant to be a parody of himself doing the splits in all of his movies. So it's like a parody of a parody. There are a couple jokes about Thor just wearing out his welcome, like he jokes about them helping out when really Thor doesn't actually need their help. Like he doesn't need to be with the Guardians for physical help, he's there more for emotional help. Like they show him crying a lot when he's hanging out with Star-Lord. James Gunn did supervise all these Guardians of the Galaxy scenes, he did have a lot of input here, and a lot of times when the Guardians do show up in somebody else's film, like all the Avengers films, James Gunn will oftentimes write the dialogue for them. They show Jane Foster getting her chemo, cancer treatments that's right out of the Mighty Thor comics arc. In that, she had breast cancer and Mjolnir was killing her faster because when she wielded it, its power burned all the chemo out of her body, allowing the cancer to grow faster. So that's how she dies quicker the more she uses it. They have cameo scenes from Darcy and Eric Selvig. This is set after WandaVision, so Darcy's already been through the events of that series. She's still working as a researcher. Eric Selvig also doing the same research he was doing the first two Thor films. Eric Selvig has also been mentioned several times in other Marvel movies. He's since written a bunch of books and starred in a Nova movie, which itself was meant to be a clever reference to the Nova character. Eventually, it seems like Marvel is going to give us a Nova series on Disney+. They also just mentioned Eric Selvig's name on the Miss Marvel series when talking about his research into wormholes between dimensions. They reveal Jane Foster has also published a book about her research into wormholes called The Foster Theory, which Love is reading on Thor's ship at the end of the movie. When she references Event Horizon, that starred Sam Neill and Lawrence Fishburne, both MCU actors now. Sam Neill is the fake version of Odin, and Lawrence Fishburne is Goliath. She also references Interstellar by Christopher Nolan, basically trying to explain science as people believe it is magic, kind of like a reverse of what happened during the first Thor film. That was what it was meant to be a callback to, Thor explaining everything to her. Darcy also makes a space viking reference, talking about Thor this time, but later in the movie they also bring it back around when Korg calls Jane Foster, Mighty Thor, a space viking, talking about the statue that they built for her. But instead of hearing an actual voice like Gore hears from the Necrosword, she just hears the ringing sound that Mjolnir makes when it flies through the sky. But that's what gives her the idea to use the power of Mjolnir to try and heal her cancer, because she sees that it can make people stronger and purge their bodies of sickness. Obviously, the research seems like it's misguided. It doesn't exactly go that way. Like, it literally is too much for her body. They play the Guns N' Roses Paradise City song when she goes back to New Asgard, and they reveal that Valkyrie, in a bid to try and make more money for her people, has basically turned it into a version of Disney World. Like, this is a Disney movie, so they kind of make a bunch of Disneyland, Disney World jokes with everything just being commercialized and turned into this big touristy destination. 
They even have jokes about them doing commercials for products too. Like they even shot a funny tie-in ad with fake Thor played by Chris Hemsworth's real life brother Luke Hemsworth for Old Spice. But this is why there are so many puns all over the place. Like they christened a new store called Infinity Cones themed after Thanos and the Infinity Gauntlet selling regular ice cream. The goat boat is an actual ship that they use for tours. The neon sign is actually an easter egg for the Tom Cruise cocktail movie. It's called the Aegir which literally means the sea. One of the local bars is called the Black Raven named after Odin's Black Ravens. They reveal that Meek is using a cyborg body and that he is a she. It's a female office worker uniform she dresses in. She's just been helping Valkyrie out. The way they explain Valkyrie is that she's also really bored at the day to day of being queen like she really really wants to go back to just being a female warrior with the other Valkyrie. She really misses the Valkyrie core that died off when they tried to kill Hela. So during the movie she thinks of Jane Foster's Thor as kind of like one of her sisters. They have another funny play this time parodying the events of Thor Ragnarok, Odin's death and Hela breaking Thor's hammer to set up the Jane Foster Mjolnir twist and the twist with her dying and going to Valhalla at the end of the movie. They brought back Matt Damon as fake Loki, Luke Hemsworth as fake Thor and Sam Neill as fake Odin. In this time they cast Melissa McCarthy as a version of Hela. After Gore's attack they also bring back Matt Damon and Luke Hemsworth for funny cameo scenes where the actors are begging Valkyrie to put on another play based on the events of Gore's attack like the people need entertainment we should put on another play. You also notice they've erected special shrines at the site where Odin actually died on the cliff face like right where he died. They have Daryl from the Thor Ragnarok Team Thor funny short giving tours. They also have a joke about how they created the shrine for the pieces of Mjolnir on the site where Hela broke it like this is literally the site where it broke. Because of the enchantment nobody could move the pieces because no one was worthy so they literally just lifted the ground up and built the shrine around it. There's a joke about that too. It's meant to be a reference to the joke at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron about the elevator lifting the hammer and the elevator not being worthy. Then there's actually a big deleted scene here where Jane Foster gets the power of Mjolnir the hammer reforms. I don't know why they deleted it they probably just wanted to move past this scene. But the idea is that Hela only broke the hammer itself. She wasn't powerful enough to destroy the enchantment on it so when Jane Foster comes close to it it's the power of the enchantment that reforms the hammer and all of her armor comes from the enchantment. Her armor is meant to be a combination of comic book Mighty Thor armor, Sif's armor and then classic Thor's armor because Thor's like you're dressed like a version of me. Then Thor gets his two goats from the comics Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder but in the comics they're not actual goats they're just like cosmic animals that help him fly through space when he needs to get around places and he's become unworthy. In the movie though they explain that they belong to these blue aliens before and they're kind of dumping them on Thor like it's not meant to be a gift it's kind of a curse. The big joke being that they suck and they just scream a lot. Mostly the goats are used for comedy like what you see in the trailers is basically the way they use them in the movie. James Gunn also revealed that the goats themselves would come back during the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special this Christmas. That's meant to be like a prequel to Guardians of the Galaxy 3 so it will be canon to the MCU. I'll do a video for that when they release a trailer but we probably won't get that till way later this year. Kraglin comes back he's wearing Yondu's fin and they reveal that he's been marrying locals on every single planet that they've gone to in the last couple of years. Then in the scene when they're revealing all the different distress calls they have a bunch of different scenes are meant to be comic book references to a bunch of pantheons of gods that Gore has already killed like all these are different Gore kills that we don't see during the movie. Natalie Portman also said that there were tons of deleted scenes and whole worlds that they cut out of the movie. I think a lot of those scenes were just showing Gore's path of destruction showing him actually killing some of these other gods. Also they explained there was a deleted scene with the Grand Master and with Eitri the Dwarf and they made it sound like that was brand new scenes that we hadn't seen before. So I think they would have also shown up in this montage or maybe during the flashbacks when they're talking about what Thor has been doing this whole time. The dead god where Thor finds Sif now minus one arm is Falagar, god of the Falagarians right out of the comics. He was actually Thor's friend. He's the person that kind of makes him realize what a threat Gore is. And then they have the funny scene where Thor says goodbye to Star Lord and the Guardians of the Galaxy. The handshake that just goes on forever. Taika Waititi also said there's a deleted scene here where they just did more and more handshake like it just keeps going on and on and on. The snake you cannot trust move I think is meant to be a reference to Loki in the world serpent. Later we also find Loki tattooed on Thor's back. The second costume upgrade that Thor has is right out of the comics. The third costume upgrade the blue gold armor is like a version of his battle armor and the rune king Thor armor with a crazy big helmet wings. When we catch up with Sif she also gets another costume upgrade which is based on her comic book armor. They have a couple of Valhalla jokes to explain how you actually make it there to set up the end of the movie. And then when they go back to New Asgard they have that funny moment during Gore's first attack where Thor sees Mjolnir for the first time and he sees Jane Foster for the first time as another version of Thor. 
So the way they explain the mechanics of this is that he's still worthy, he can still pick up the hammer, it's just that the hammer has temporarily chosen Jane Foster as its main wielder, so it obeys her commands first in battle, and if she were to die during some other battle, then it would answer his call. That's why at the end of the film, after she dies, he's able to wield it like he normally would. They have a bigger flashback to explain why they broke up. This is all right after the ending of Thor The Dark World, and it sounds like their relationship only lasted for a little while before going their separate ways, because when he says they've been separated for over eight years, that's basically like right up to the end of Dark World. But the joke with her thinking it's only been a couple years, I think is meant to be a reference to her being snapped, like she missed five years of her life, which is why it seems like eight years to Thor, but closer to like three years for her. They have a couple funny moments here too about Thor's relationship with the hammer, like they use the hammer to go rollerblading together. They also pay that off later when Thor's like, are you still rollerblading? I've been rollerblading a little bit. Then the reason why Gore can pick up Stormbreaker is because it doesn't have that same worthiness enchantment on it that the hammer does. Even Thanos is able to pick up Stormbreaker during Avengers Endgame and use it to try and kill Thor. Valkyrie joins them wielding Odin's spear, which Thor gave her when he gave her the title. She's also riding her winged horse, Aragorn. In the comics, the Black Knight, Kit Harington's character actually gave her that horse. Obviously in the MCU, it's an ancient horse that was given to her by Odin a long time ago, so it's a little bit different backstory. They have a joke about it being a portal horse. The joke is, is that it can open portals across space like the Bifrost. Later in the movie, that's how Jane Foster gets back to eternity. You notice in the town hall the next day when they're all meeting, Valkyrie is wearing a Phantom of the Opera t-shirt. I've already explained Heimdall's son, Astrid. The reason why he can contact Thor across space is because he has all the same powers that Heimdall did. That's also why his eyes glow the same way that Heimdall's do. One of Heimdall's big abilities in the comics, though, is literally just farsight. He can see anything across the universe as long as he focuses on it. So, like, he can't see everything simultaneously all at once. You'd have to tell him what you're looking for, and then he'd be able to find it. When Thor's talking about Omnipotent City and the Gods, he mentions a couple specific really powerful ones. Ra, the leader of the pantheon of gods that Khonshu comes from that we saw in Moon Knight, he's actually meant to be Khonshu's father in the comics, also called Amit. We also see Boss the Panther Goddess later in the film. That's the goddess that Black Panther and the people of Wakanda worship. She's meant to be Khonshu's sister, also the daughter of Ra. He mentions Hercules, setting up the cameo scene in the post credit scene, also kind of letting you know that he thinks of Hercules as being one of the most powerful gods. Thor and Hercules have a long history in the comics. Hercules is a huge Marvel character, so I'll talk about him a little bit more when we get to that part of the movie. He mentions Tomei Toenga, Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec god. The people in the MCU at one time actually believed that Ajax, the Eternals character, was a version of that god, when really it is an actual god. This also kind of connects to Black Panther too. The reason why they're doing so much stuff with the MCU gods in Moon Knight and now in Thor Love and Thunder is to help set up Black Panther 2, where we see a version of Namor, who also forms a contract with one of their people's gods, the same way that Black Panther has a contract with Boss the Panther goddess. I just did a really big Black Panther 2 first look video explaining that and what his god tier avatar form looks like, so I'll link that below in the description. Then when he starts talking about Zeus, the way they play MCU Zeus is that he's the leader of the Godhead and Thor claims that he's the oldest god who's still alive in the MCU. The Godhead and Omnipotent City are both right out of the comics. The Godhead is like a congregation of the most powerful gods. It was featured during the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet storyline. They don't meet that often, the way they play in the movie is a little bit different. Omnipotent City comes right out of the Gore comic storyline, and the history of that place is that it was actually created by a group of elder gods after they had this ancient version of an Avengers Endgame god tier situation just fighting with each other until most of them had been killed off. The survivors of the battle called the Truce, creating Omnipotent City as this place of fellowship to mark the Truce, and it basically just served as this meeting place of all the most powerful gods. During the Gore storyline, Thor travels there just looking for more information about Gore the God Butcher. But the way they use it in the movie is in a slightly more comedic, more crazy way. But just anybody can't travel there. Like the normal Avengers couldn't go there if they wanted to. They'd have to have Thor with them who brought them there. Although after the movie, maybe not so much now because it seems like the rest of the gods kind of hate Thor now. And when they actually travel to the city, there are hundreds, hundreds of gods in the background here. You could spend hours just picking through all of them, zooming in, enhancing, trying to spot them all if we had a high enough res version of the movie. They only reference a couple of them directly, like the emotion gods. Basically, they're gods for like every single concept, every single culture in the universe. That's why there's so many of them. There's a dragon god, which seems like more of a Shang-Chi reference to the great protector cosmic dragon from that alternate dimension. There's the god of magic, the god of dreams, which is a giant eyeball. The god of carpentry is actually meant to be a joke about Jesus, but like they have Bao, the god of dumplings, a giant dumpling. That was actually meant to be a reference to the Pixar short movie, also called Bao, about the dumpling boy. That is one delicious looking god right there. 
they show the Cronin God of Korg's people. The joke where he says, hey, ninny nani is actually a song that Taika Waititi wrote for the movie and then sings on the goat boat later. Basically, the song's just about getting it on. I also think his throne is meant to be a big Game of Thrones Iron Throne joke because it's made of a bunch of pairs of scissors like the Iron Throne is made of a bunch of melted swords. You notice in the background, they also have a couple of giant celestials, not because they're gods, like they're not gods, they're just really powerful cosmic beings. You find out that Zeus calls his thunderbolt thunder, Thor is the god of thunder, and they make a couple of jokes about him being very similar to Zeus, like I, I bet you've probably detected I based a lot of myself on him, like he's the god of lightning, I'm the god of thunder. And I believe at the end of the movie, they don't give him thunder back, like they still have his lightning bolt weapon at New Asgard. On the goat boat when they're escaping, Thor references Zeus and the other gods hunting them down for the rest of their days. That's just meant to be a reference to the post credit scene where Zeus sends Hercules after him declaring war on all the Avengers and all superheroes. Korg references Thor being a dad, having a baby, meant to set up this twist with him raising Gore's child. And in the comics, during the Gore storyline, they did reveal Thor's three daughters, so eventually he does have daughters in the comics. Gore's able to steal Stormbreaker from Thor as they Bifrost back to New Asgard because there's no worthiness enchantment on it so he can literally just pick it up and uses that to summon the doorway where Eternity is. So like the temple has at least seven cosmic entities inside it. There's Eternity itself, the Living Tribunal, the Watcher, some of you think this Celestial is the Prime Celestial, there's Death, Eon, and Infinity. I've already done longer videos explaining who all these cosmic entities are, but like Death for instance was from the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet storyline. Eternity is meant to be the living embodiment of everything in the universe, like the actual MCU itself. So when they actually travel into this cosmic place in the center of the universe where it actually exists, it's kind of like them looking at themselves because they're looking at the actual universe. That's why its body is the star field. You also notice on the doorway where the Bifrost is meant to open the portal, the symbol is the same symbol that the Bifrost burns into the ground every time that it opens. When Thor grants the power of Thor to all these children, that's just meant to be a wink at the Thor core from the Secret Wars arc with many, many versions of Thor at once. They explain that after Jane Foster comes back using Valkyrie's winged horse in the portals, she destroys the Necrosaur like it disintegrates into nothingness. And lots of you asking what Jane Foster whispered to Thor before she died, she was suggesting a new catchphrase and he was just responding to her saying, oh, that's the best one yet. So you can post all your theories what you think her catchphrase was. I've already explained how Gore brings his daughter back using his wish to eternity and how they kind of changed that from the comics. In the comics, eternity doesn't really work like that, but it is meant to have nigh omnipotence inside the MCU. Like it has control over all time and all space. So it can do things like that. It could bring a version of his daughter back. When they go back to New Asgard, they reveal the statue to mighty Thor. Valkyrie starts training all the different children. Sif with her one arm starts training Heimdall's son. Korg pays off the joke about the way that their race reproduces in the volcanoes with this new person that it seems like he's going to have a child with. And they just have a bunch of jokes with Thor being dad to Gore's child, like a bunch of father-daughter jokes, just like casual, like they're regular people. She's reading Jane Foster's book. She draws all over Thor's hammer. It's just meant to be annoying things that little kids do. I've already explained the title sequence, Thor Love and Thunder, like the actual name of the movie. But then they have this very 80s themed end credit sequence with all the different names done in 80s album fonts. I just posted a much longer post credit scene video about both of the big post credit scenes. The first one was Zeus and Hercules then declaring war on the Avengers. I'll post a link to that at the end of this. The second post credit scene is Jane Foster going to Valhalla. I also discussed that during that separate post credit scene video. But the idea is that yes, she can come back, like she's just existing in a different dimension. We just saw a version of that happen during the Moon Knight series. Just because you go to this alternate dimension doesn't mean that you can never come back. But if there were any Easter eggs or references or big questions that you have from the movie that I didn't address in the video, just write them below in the comments. Even though it was a short movie, you could rewatch it like a hundred times and still find new Easter eggs and references in the background. I will do some more bonus videos for the movie, but the real big thing that's coming up is Marvel Comic Con. They're supposed to be dropping the Black Panther 2 trailer, so when that releases, of course I'll do new videos for that. They're also bringing the new X-Men animated series episodes in What If Season 2 and some other animation stuff to Comic Con, so there'll be a bunch of big trailers in the next couple weeks. Everyone click here for my full Thor Love and Thunder post credit scene video, and click here for my brand new Black Panther 2 first look video and easter eggs. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.